Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. My name is Dr. Eduardo J. Gomez, Associate Professor in the College of Health at Lehigh University and Director of our undergraduate program. It gives me great joy to welcome all of you to our inaugural College of Health Colloquium Series. Our College of Health is the first in the world to offer undergraduate, graduate, and executive education degree and certificates in population health, where they focus on health innovation and technology. In our colloquium series, we provide lectures from local, national, and international leaders on our time's most pressing population health challenges. Population health is a convergent science investigating the multiple determinants of health from cell to society. As such, our colloquium series touches on a broad range of topics related to health and healthcare. Today, we are more than honored to have as our inaugural speaker for our colloquium series, Ms. Joan London. Ms. London is an award-winning journalist, best-selling author, television host, as well as a motivational speaker. She has been a trusted voice in American homes for more than 40 years. For two decades, Miss London greeted viewers every morning on the, Good, on the Good Morning America show, which made her the longest running female host ever on early morning television. An ardent health and senior advocate, Miss London has also testified before the Food and Drug Administration advocating mandatory mammogram reporting. She has also testified before the Congressional House Ways and Means Committee advocating for the Family and Medical Leave Act. Currently, Ms. London is the host of the Washington Post podcast series, Caring for Tomorrow, which focuses on the future of healthcare. She also hosts the PBS television series, Second Opinion with Joan London, which will premiere starting this January. Ms. London's newest book is titled, Why Did I Come Into This Room? A Candid Conversation About Aging, which quickly became a New York Times bestseller. She has also authored other books such as Chicken Soup for the Soul, Family Caregiving, Growing Up Healthy, Protecting Your Child from Diseases Now Through Adulthood, Wake Up Calls, and A Bend in the Road is Not the End of the Road. Today, Ms. London will be giving a presentation titled The Media's Role in Guiding Populations During Health Crisis. As we all know, the media plays a vital role in how we perceive population health crisis, as we're seeing today with the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, and without further ado, it's a great honor to introduce Ms. London for our presentation. If you could please hold your questions until the end, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, and I also want to extend my thanks to Dean Witt uh, for inviting me here to kick off the this speaker series for the College of Health. Um, you know, it's been a couple of years now since Dean Witt uh, first asked me to meet with her and discuss the mission of the new college, that being the study of population health. And we discussed the need for programs that would teach um, data collection and tracking and interpreting that data, as well as programs to explore translating that data to the public and the communi uh, communicators who do that, journalists. The journalists kind of stand in that space between scientists and the public. And I was thrilled to hear that since I stand in that space. And here we are today with an incredible new College of Health building going up on the Lehigh campus. And also I would venture to say, we all have a new appreciation for the need to study the health of populations around the globe and to track potential health crises like the pandemic that we are now living through. But I do think that the term population health is still new to a lot of people. So what exactly do we mean by population health? Well, when examining and tracking a population, that can certainly mean a continent or a country. It can also be a generation or a population living in say senior communities or nursing homes or in prison communities, or it can even be those living on a college campus. But each of these different populations has particular risks and needs. We can also look at a population by age, by gender, uh, by one's ethnicity or socioeconomic standing. In fact, we can also track health trends by one's zip code. 
and also pandemic deaths by zip code, since often it can simply be your zip code that will determine your access to quality care, um, to even nutritious foods, which can ultimately determine your personal health risk and your life expectancy. And when we look at tracking the health of populations globally, well, that effort began when 51 diplomats from countries around the world met in 1945 to form the United Nations. The world had experienced the horrific Spanish flu epidemic um, decades before. So the founders of the UN were determined to not only make a global commitment to maintaining international peace and security around the world, but also to developing and promoting human rights and global health standards. So in 1948, the World Health Organization was founded with the mission to track the health issues of countries, their health trends, diseases, migration, and potential world health crises. And here we are in the middle of a global health crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic. Every day we see the rising numbers of hospitalizations and deaths. But to give you some perspective of what all this means, I thought we might look back in history just a bit because we have seen over the decades just what pandemics can do. That 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, it infected about 500 million people, which means at that time it was one third of the world's population. And of those, around 50 million people died. In 1957, we saw the Asian flu pandemic. That caused a death toll worldwide of 2 million people. 1968, the world experienced what was referred to as the Hong Kong flu. And within just a few months, that spread around the globe. It killed about a million people. And then in 2009, we had the H1N1 outbreak that was also known as the swine flu. And that killed over a half a million people worldwide, about 13,000 here in our country. And while that pandemic ended, that virus actually continues to circulate as a seasonal flu. And it causes illness and hospitalizations and deaths. Then in the early 1980s, the world was introduced to the human immunodeficiency virus or HIV, which causes AIDS. That caused an estimated 25 million deaths worldwide. And the CDC now reports that while there have been new treatments that have allowed more people to live with the disease, about 1.1 million Americans currently are living with that disease and an estimated 38 thousand new HIV infections still happen every year. Now, more recently, we, were experience, we experienced SARS and MERS and the Ebola outbreaks. However, while those deadly disease, diseases, they did ravage populations in some parts of the world. However, the global effort to track and contact trace and contain those diseases really proved very successful. However, the WHO and the CDC have never before been challenged as they have been in the past 10 months with a deadly airborne virus. And this airborne virus is circulating in a very new world environment of global business and air travel and a very new age in media. We all get our news and information every day from multiple uh, media platforms, maybe the traditional TV, radio, newspapers, or now the vast internet, as well as social media platforms. And what has really changed in recent years is that we often get not only the factual news of the day, but that platform's interpretation of the news. And sometimes we actually get that platform's own agenda. So much so, that now the World Health Organization recently declared that we're not just fighting a pandemic, we are also fighting an infodemic. 
And this infodemic, according to the WHO, has been able to spread so quickly misinformation, which can then interfere with health decisions by individuals, by healthcare providers, and even sadly, policymakers. And to make matters worse, the current infodemic has not only been spreading misinformation, it has also allowed for the spread of disinformation. And that is deliberate misinformation, which is posted on sites to manipulate how we think and also to disrupt our society. The spread of all this misinformation on different media platforms is made worse by something called algorithms. This is the way social media platforms were built, using algorithms which were intended to help give you more news and entertainment and, of course, commercials that would interest you. If any of you have not watched the Netflix special called The Social Dilemma, you need to. It's a documentary about how the social media platforms were initially built, not only to connect us, but also to feed us information that, frankly, we like and that we desire. That's where algorithms come into play. The more we click on things, the more the algorithms understand how we think and what we like. And then it feeds us more things that we like. So these algorithms were first formulated to service us, but they have ended up almost controlling what we think about the world and life and the people around us. Any one of you could Google the same word or issue as me, and we would probably see completely different choices come up in our feed to click on. So in today's media, in essence, in the end, we kind of all have our own set of facts. So this new form of media has in large part fed into the very divisive nature of our country today, politically and socially, because you only see what reinforces what you believe to be right, and I only see what reinforces what I believe. And this is really troubling when you're looking at that intersection of health and the media and the public. And frankly, the viral spread of misinformation has really not only spread through social media, but at times I think we'd all agree even into the media at large. And that's because the landscape of television has changed significantly over the past decade, with some cable news channels becoming politically biased. And with that change, we have seen the erosion in the public's trust. And thus we've seen unprecedented attacks against political leaders and even the media itself, and even scientists. So with it all, we have witnessed, I think an even more concerning shift where sometimes even public policy decisions seem to be driven by ideology and politics that we see on TV instead of facts and scientific evidence. And this is all happening at a time when the delivery of public health messaging is critical. America has faced and overcome enormous public health challenges. Just think, cigarette smoking, drunk driving, seat belt wearing, the eradication of polio, uh, a measles vaccine, and finding treatment for HIV AIDS. Challenges that required changes in thinking, changes in public policy, and changes in behavior. And all of that required a cooperative effort with the media. And herein lies the critical importance of that intersection between journalism and health and the importance of science. We are living in a time of such disinformation and distrust that the American Medical Associ Association recently issued an urgent plea to us all. They called on elected officials to affirm science and evidence and fact in all of their words and actions. They called on the media 
to be vigilant in communicating factual information from credible sources. They called on the tech platforms to also advance evidence-based information and to look for ways to reduce the spread of misinformation. They called for an environment in which physicians and scientists feel free to communicate evidence-based factual information so that the public can begin to trust once again, so that they can feel confident about the safety and efficacy of new treatments and the impending COVID vaccines. And finally, they called for the robust collection of data during this pandemic, including data segmented by race and ethnicity to make sure that we have a thorough understanding of the pandemic and its impact on every community. And thus that brings us back to the study of population health. But it is not only during times of crises like a pandemic that the study of population health is important. Societal trends um, and demographic changes in populations also have consequences. So they need to be carefully tracked. For instance, dramatic in, uh, advances in medicine and public health and even lifestyle management have led to a decline in fertility and an increase in longevity. And those two trends together have led to increases in life expectancy and what is called population aging. That is a shift in a country's demographics to more older people. And it's happening in countries all over the globe. And aging populations pose a lot of challenges for countries. Governments have to find ways to cut public spending from education or infrastructure in order to increase spending on pension, healthcare, uh, and social benefits for the growing elderly population. And not all countries are equally ready to face these challenges. If you just look right here in the United States, there are now more Americans, 65 or older, than at any other time in history. In 1900, there were less than 3 million people over the age of 65. By 2000, there were 35 million people over the age of 65. And today there's 50 million. And by 2030, we are expected to have that over 65 crowd top 72 million. And at that point, there are going to be a lot more people over 65 than under 18. And as you look at this enormous age wave, uh, some people call it the silver tsunami, a demographic shift of this magnitude will undoubtedly trigger social changes, changes in the labor market, and will most certainly require changes in our healthcare delivery systems, which will be challenged to meet the growing demands of an aging population. And we're already seeing some of these changes happening right now. For instance, the conventional wisdom that the best healthcare is delivered in person, in the doctor's office, is really being upended by telehealth. This change in healthcare delivery has been in the works for years, and the medical industry expected it to kind of roll out over the next few years. Um, we saw it literally come online overnight due to the pandemic. And it was our aging population, as well as uh, rising healthcare costs, and also a shortage of physicians that made that traditional model of in-person care become increasingly unsustainable. Virtual health will in large part take its place and it's going to change the way we all interact with our doctors and with the healthcare system. And they're going to use mobile phones and apps and digital health sensors to deliver us health services. So virtual health is the future of healthcare really because it has the potential to boost the capacity of primary care doctors without actually adding or training 
more professionals. And this is because it comes at a time when the American Association of Medical Colleges projects a shortage of as many as 40,000 primary care physicians just in the next decade in this country. And experts feel that the aging of this huge baby boom generation, that it could fuel more than a 50% increase in the number of Americans requiring nursery home, nursery home care. I mean, nursing home care will have to expand exponentially. And the demand for elder care will also be driven by a really stark, uh, steep rise in the number of people living with Alzheimer's. And that disease is expected to more than double by 2050. Even senior living communities will likely need to rethink their business model, building or redesigning structures to be more like college dorms, where rooms could be shared by other seniors in order to accommodate the greater need for housing and also to keep the mounting costs in line. So as you can see, as the demographics of a population shift, there are a multitude of consequences for a country. And public health officials and health institutions will have to look to the media to help translate what this all means to us as individuals and to our society as a whole. Now at the forefront of this big age wave is the baby boomer population. And those are people who were born um, during the post-World War II baby boom between 1946 and 1964. I'm one of those baby boomers, but there are 78 million of us in the American population. And every eight seconds, another boomer turns 65. That's more than 10,000 a day, 4 million per year. So not surprisingly, the experts are keeping a close eye on this particular population. Um, I think I'm a prime example of how differently those in this boomer population are living their lives today and approaching aging in a whole new unprecedented way. Uh, we aren't assuming that we have to retire at any particular age. Um, and I think most would like to define aging as a continuum of reinvention. And that changes the American workplace, uh, which is another much studied population. Today, the Bureau of Labor tells us that young Americans who are 18 years old might have a dozen jobs by the time they're in their mid thirties. Not to mention these young entrants into the workplace are going to be competing with all those people who are turning 65 who have no intention of retiring. And why, why aren't they retiring? Well, with modern medicine, uh, people tend to be healthier and more engaged in life and they are living longer. So life expectancy, that is another demographic that has been tracked around the world for decades. If you look at it here in our country, in 1930, the average life expectancy was 59 and a half. Now by 1960, 30 years, because of a lot of medical advances, the life expectancy in the US was up to 70. And today it's 81 for women and 76 for men. That demographic shift really becomes evidence when you look at that, that segment of the US population that is, has the most rapid growth. And surprisingly, it's the population referred to as oldest old. And that means over a hundred years old. Now in 1950 in this country, there were less than 2000 people who were over a hundred. By 2000, there were 72, thousand Americans over a hundred. Today, there are 214,000 people over a hundred. And by 2050, they predict there will be 834,000 people over a hundred. So what does that mean 
for the future. Well, I thought I'd share with you not too long ago, there was a Time Magazine, here it is, featured this little baby on its cover. Now the story right here is about scientists studying aging and they report that the person who will live, are you ready for this? The person who will live to be 142 has already been born. I don't know, is that incredibly amazing? or is that incredibly daunting? One thing for sure, if we're gonna be living that much longer, we better be living healthier. And interestingly, there are actually some populations around the world that have been found to live exponentially longer and healthier lives than the rest of the world's population. They have been called the blue zones and they were the focus of a National Geographic exploration of shared lifestyle habits that create an environment where a particular population flourishes and lives exponentially longer than the rest of the world. That exploration was led by Daniel Buettner, who wrote the book, Blue Zones. And he deemed these havens of population health and longevity, five of them. Now, one of them is, I think I'm gonna pronounce these correctly, Barbaja in Sardinia, um, Ikaria in Greece, uh, the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, it's back way behind all the mountains, um, very far away from other, from civilization, which if you will, um, also Okinawa in Japan, and also one of those zones is right here in the United States. It is a region of Loma Linda, California, which happens to have the highest concentration of Seventh-day Adventists, um, which is a religion that, religion that follows a vegetarian diet and a very tight community-oriented life, which by nature is lower stress. The result, they are said to live 10 years longer than the rest of us here in America. I mean, this does beg the question, what can we learn from these havens of longevity? But it also begs the question, if life expectancy is increasing in a population, what plans need to be made? It will certainly call for the scientific community to find ways to try to limit frailty and retain mental acuity for our government it will present a real fiscal challenge to meet the needs of an aging population. And to us as a society, it will most certainly change workplaces and I think everyone's expectations for their later years. But let's talk about the workplace. When we focus on the workplace itself as a population, we have already seen it go through a dramatic change over the last 50 years with the emergence of women. In fact, in the past few years, we saw the, for the very first time in our history, the number of women in the US workforce overtake the number of men. Right now, I think it's a, women make up just a little bit under half of our nation's workforce. And then when you look at women as a population, Many of them are working in order to contribute financially to their family, but women also work today because they want to be successful and independent, and they want to have a chance to make a difference in the world. In fact, the emergence of women has changed the face of college campuses. Women today are earning more college degrees than men in every single category associate, bachelor, master's, and doctorate. And we are currently living in an era with the highest ever number of female leaders simultaneously running governments around the globe. This last year, it was 22. That's a record high. In major countries, um, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Denmark, England, Germany, Switzerland, just to name a few. And of course, we just saw Kamala Harris become the first woman elected to a high office here in our country to be the next vice president of the United States. Now, amidst 
all of these amazing advances for women. When you look at the female population here in the United States from a health point of view, it does look like what this new world has meant for working women as a population is that they often find themselves feeling like they're really working two full-time jobs, the job they have outside the home and that full-time job waiting for them back at home, caring for a house, having and raising children, and these days, sometimes caring for elderly parents. That has become a stressful mix that has meant compromise health for many in this particular population. But the study of populations, whether it's by gender or generation, can be just as consequential to nations as pandemics. For instance, one of the more recent generations to come into focus and of great concern is the millennial generation. Now, those were the ones born between the years of 1981 and 1996. And there are 73 million millennials. They make up the largest percentage of the population today and one third of the US labor force. They're the most educated um, and the most connected generation ever, which really does place them at the heart of the US economic growth as, as consumers, as workers, and as business owners. However, they are also the unhealthiest generation in our history. They are showing double digit increases in eight of 10 major health issues, including major depression, substance abuse, hyperactivity, uh, psychotic conditions, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, as well as high cholesterol and hypertension and type two diabetes. These are usually conditions found in much older adults. And especially troubling in this latest population study was that millennials health was starting to decline at age 27. And that is much younger than any other generation. And by the way, women in that millennial group were found to be about 20% less healthy than the men. And when you look at the core issues that brought this generation to this point, it's been noted that this is a generation that came in with high expectations in life, many with post-secondary degrees, but they arrived at a time of recession, unemployment, lower wages, and many of them with massive student debt. And then on top of that, a survey from Caring Advisor found that around half of the millennial population is already taking care of their parents. I mean, can we just say that adds up to a whole lot of stress? The study also found that millennials are less happy on the job. Um, you know, with older generations, it was quite common for someone to work for the same company from their 20s right on through retirement. And that was a lot of stability. However, millennials say that they feel like their employers don't really care about them. So in turn, they don't show much loyalty to the companies that they work for. And they're found to be constantly job hunting and changing jobs. Well, that instability and unpredictability is also incredibly stressful. As for being a, a connected generation, they also reported 30% feeling lonely and not having as many close friends. And that was a University of Pennsylvania study which said they found a strong correlation between increased time spent on social media and decreased well-being. And you know, while we might think of millennials as kind of the yoga and green juices generation, it just seems that that doesn't actually translate always to being healthy. Why was it the change in our country's food supply, which of course has been bombarded with fast food and processed foods, 
high in calories and fat and low in nutrition? Well, yeah, in part. But the studies of this population also found uh, and pointed to the fact that millennials feel a real disconnect with the healthcare system. They say it's inconvenient, expensive, and you have to travel and then wait at a doctor's office. Two thirds of them report not going to a doctor until they're really sick or need urgent care. Most say that when they get sick, the first thing they do is they Google it. A lot of information, but not necessarily the best information. And why do they Google it? Because they don't have a primary care physician. And some don't have health insurance. And this generation welcomes telehealth so that they can get it when they want it, wherever they want it. A report by Blue Cross Blue Shield, and it was entitled The Disarming, Disarming the Ticking Millennial Time Bomb. That says a lot. It concluded that if the current pace of decline in the millennial health generation continues unabated, the long-term consequences to the U.S. economy could be severe. And you know, this kind of data research, which is so important, it also serves as a call to action. Um, the healthcare community must find more targeted ways to reach this population on different platforms. And there, of course, is a real role for the media to play in bringing about more awareness. But of course, to be effective, the current lack of trust in this country must be addressed. Because we're at a point where many people are so distrustful that they find themselves unable to heed the advice of healthcare experts. And many report that they are also vaccine hesitant. And yet the vaccine for COVID-19 is likely going to be the only way to stop the pandemic in its tracks. And we've seen what vaccine hesitancy can do. In 2019, we saw a sharp decline in people getting the MMR vaccine. That's the measles vaccine. Not surprisingly, we also saw a steep increase in measles that year. The vaccine preventable disease, measles. Now that anti-vaccine movement was born out of a study that has since been proven to be faulty due to flawed research that attempted to link the measles vaccine to autism and which was really propelled in great part by social media platforms. And frankly, it's continued to gain steam to the point that it's really no longer a tiny fringe movement. In fact, the World Health Organization recently listed vaccine hesitancy as a, as a leading global health threat. And the more politicized the COVID vaccines become, the less likely people will be willing to take it. And the more the media is going to be needed to help meet that challenge. Um, I've been in broadcasting for a little over 40 years now. And as I see it, journalists today really do face unique challenges in covering health news in this current era of, uh, shall we call it, political entanglement. They've got to be extra vigilant. They must investigate and report any possible conflicts of interest among sources of health information, anyone promoting a new therapy, or of course, wonder drug, or any possible links between researchers and private companies. Because failing to do that could mean that a journalist could become an unwitting mouthpiece for biased or even flawed information. And candidly, these kinds of conflicts or flawed studies are not so readily apparent. So journalists today have to look for them as a routine part of story research and interviews. 
and editors and reporters and writers in the health field, they also have to really scrutinize the terminology that they use. If it is vague or sensationalized in any way, breakthrough, a cure, it can ultimately cause harm for news consumers. I believe that journalists have really a responsibility to investigate and report on the people's needs as they fight an illness or as they struggle to navigate the healthcare system. Because in that sense, there is an inherent educational role that journalists need to assume. So for all you students that are participating today, as you make your way through your college years and begin to discover those areas that pique your interest and your desire perhaps to pursue as you look to your future, the areas of study with the College of Health may hold some of the best career opportunities because this past year has shown us all the importance of studying population health. The aging of the world's population is clearly indicating the future need for many, many more primary care physicians, gerontologists, as well as nurses and caregivers, um, and of course, scientists in the fields of population health and aging and the aging brain. You can make an impact on millions of lives through health innovation and technology and shape the future of health and health care through a lens of social justice as the next generation of highly skilled researchers and scientists. And just think the work includes fields of epidemiology, medicine, data science, biostatistics, health economics, health policy, global health, community health, and health innovation and technology. Everything having to do with the health of a population from water and air quality to race and ethnicity to economic conditions and policy decisions, truly from cell to society, you can have the power to make an incredible difference. And I would urge you to be open to new possibilities that you might not have thought of for yourself. But if you give it a try, it might just be something at which you'd be terrific. And don't limit your belief in yourself and what, what you might be capable of or what you might excel in. Because we can often really surprise ourselves. And in that, I will share with you that I've surprised myself. When I was hosting Good Morning America, I was constantly asked by organizations to speak. And I did everything I could to get out of every one of those requests. Why? Because I had a fear of public speaking back then. I know, how could I be afraid of speaking in front of a few hundred people when 23 million people saw me every week? Well, I never saw any of them. So when I left Good Morning America, I signed on with the international uh, motivational speaker, Tony Robbins, to, and I joined him on a two-year speaking tour. Every appearance was in a stadium with 15 to 20,000 people. It was terrifying at first, but in time, the more I put myself in front of those audiences, the more comfortable I felt and the more confident I became at writing speeches. So cut to today. Before this pandemic, I was traveling all across this country week in and week out, giving about 40 speeches a year. And you know what? Loving every minute of it. I'm kind of a walking example for you of the fact that you can turn a total fear into a total passion. And while most people are going to advise you to follow your passion, one of the biggest questions that comes up is, so how do I really discover what is my passion? 
Well, finding our passions, our value, and how we want to shape our lives and maybe more importantly, how do we want to impact the lives of others? That is our adventure. And your life story is not going to be determined so much by what life brings to you, but by the attitude and the perseverance that you bring to life. And I wish all you students much success. All right, let's bring Ed back in. Professor Gomez, I'm sorry. <laughs> and we'll take some questions uh, from the audience. Hey, Ed. Well, thank you so much, Joan. Thank you so much for a wonderful uh, presentation. I learned so much and, uh, and I'm sure all of our audience did as well. And so uh, I guess I'll go ahead and start off with a question, if you don't mind. Um, how, should you, how should our society and especially our students here at Lehigh go about reading the news in the time of COVID-19? Now, oftentimes I get questions from students about, you know, which news source should I read? How should I read the news? Uh, what are your suggestions, your insights? And, you know, in this time when we're being flooded with all this information about COVID-19, the vaccines and policies, what are your thoughts about how we should be reading the news and analyzing it? I think that today you really can't take everything at face value. You really have to look at um, the origination of that story. Um, has that story, is it really being originated by that particular platform? Or has someone taken it from somewhere else? And what was the agenda of that other platform? It's important to know what sources today information comes from. And you need to be able to learn how to Google search. And that's something that you are all being uh, taught, I'm sure, there in uh, on the campus of Lehigh um, so that you can verify where information is coming from. Because the problem today is this tendency um, for people to see a story and immediately they hit that button and they share it and they share it with others. Well, if that source came from um, not a verified credible news source, then you're sharing information that could be untrue. And during this health crisis, like we're experiencing a pandemic, if you share information um, about how to deal with the, with the health crisis and it's not true, you could be harming someone else's health. The problem is, is most people think that they're doing something good. Like, oh, I saw this story, I'm gonna share it with you. And the population that is the most worrisome when it comes to this question are the elderly. And I won't even say elderly, but just the older population. Um, and why? Because they grew up in a time when everybody could believe everything. You never second guessed what you heard on the evening newscasts, what you read in the newspapers, what you heard from your political leaders. That's how they grew up. And that is how they view news today and so many older people they that's their connection to the outside world that ipad you know that that laptop so they can spend their days entertained by and they still feel connected to the outside world and what's happening by that platform that they're looking at but as i talked about today they can be getting their own set of facts and it not may not be the real facts so they're the ones that are the most worrisome. Um, so it's, in, it's really incumbent upon all of us to fact check everything that we see today. Like you have to do that when you're writing papers and uh, you know you have to fact check everything that you write. But it's really become necessary for every news consumer in the world today to kind of go back to that fact checking process. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joan. Uh, that's fantastic. And I'm going to go ahead and read some questions from the audience now. Okay. Um, the first one is, what do you envision, what do you envision as the media's role in demonstrating the combined impact of COVID-19 and systemic racism, racism, and mm. violence, both of which individually gain a great deal of media coverage in the past few months? You know, this is the bane of existence, I think, for news outlets, you have to cover the news. 
And what that really means is that you're covering things, you're covering stories about people who are putting falsehoods out there. And, you know, it's, it's so concerning as to why all this is going on. Um, it's mostly, I think, politically motivated, um, but there are long lasting effects of it because what happens is that we're creating this uh, distrust of even the media. And the media has been there for decades and decades to make sure that you got the real information. But the real news today isn't always the real news. It is all too often the interpretation by someone, by a cable network, whatever, of that news of that day. So it's going to be a real challenge. I mean, not just for the media, but for our future governments, for our society, but certainly for the media, since we're kind of the interlocutor between political leaders and information and scientists and you, the public. Um, it's going to be an incredible challenge to regain the trust of people, which is the only way we're really going to be able to kind of really, I hate to say it, but put our society, put our American collective society back together. Um, but it's very difficult when every person has their own set of facts. And, you know, I talk about algorithms. That's a genie that can't really be put back in the bottle. Um, and, you know, the tech platforms are hard pressed to figure out a way to put that genie in the bottle. And so many people these days get their news, quite honestly, from social media platforms and from internet sites, which again, can have their own agenda. You know, I talked about that plea by the AMA to the media to be extra vigilant for political leaders also to be extra vigilant in what they say and what they do. And for tech platforms, to try to find some way to reduce this, you know, spread of misinformation. Um, you know, that, that question is, if I had the answer to that question, I'd run for president. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Thank you so much. Um, well, I have another question from the audience. Um, do you have any insight as to why there is a decrease in the number of primary care physicians? Ah, all right. That's that disconnect, and it's a really troubling um, number today because uh, it's not just the millennial generation. That's really where it popped up, where it started. It's also the generation, I always get mixed up if that's Gen X or Gen Z, but any of students watching right now, it's your generation. But this is where it started, where there is this disconnect um, with an overloaded healthcare system, it's becoming, it has become increasingly difficult to get that appointment with the doctor. It's three months out. Um, you have to take time off from school or work to go. You have to wait in that doctor's office for that eight minutes in front of the doctor. Um, and as the younger generations have become disenchanted with that, uh, they, have, they have this disconnect. They don't want to travel. They don't want to wait. Um, but without having that primary care physician, there is great value in going to that annual checkup once a year. And if you have insurance coverage, it covers it. And if you don't have that primary care physician where you're going for that annual checkup and any other doctors that you're going to, specialists, they all report back to usually, as that's the way it's supposed to work, they report back to that primary care physician. And that is kind of the, the holder of all of your health information. And by the way, saying that, I say you should really be the holder of all of your health information. You should be the CEO and the manager of that health information. Um, but when you don't have that annual checkup happening every year, you don't see a rise in your A1C. You don't get somebody pointing out that you're deficient in vitamin D. You don't find out, you don't see any of the nuances of your well-being. And what, you, what they do instead is they wait until they're so sick that they tend to end up in either urgent care or a hospital emergency room. And that is just not, even from an, a fiscal point of view, 
It's the worst way that our healthcare should work, having you end up in an ER. This is where I think the media can play a very big part because we need to understand how to translate that to a generation, this millennials and the ones coming behind it. That's also going to take um, uh, an effort by the healthcare industry in how to target that information. Finding out where are those eyeballs? Where are the millennials? Where are their eyeballs? And targeting this awareness of the need to have a primary care physician and the importance of those annual checkups. Now, maybe this is gonna be helped by telehealth where you know the this is a generation that says they want virtual health so they get it when they want it where they want it they don't have to go anywhere for it and you know it is the hope of the healthcare industry that telehealth will help bridge that gap but from an awareness point of view um, those of us in the media we can try to figure out how to target really target those and reach those eyeballs that most need to hear these messages to increase their awareness of why this is you know really a, a bad shift in healthcare? Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, the next question an audience ha member has is: uh, Do you think the millennial population truly has higher rates of adverse health outcomes, or is it related to an increase in reporting, surveillance, and diagnostic testing? that makes it appear that they have poor health outcomes compared to earlier generations? That is always that question. Whenever you're looking at data, that is always the burning question. And there might be different answers for different populations, for different data coming from different population studies. Um, but I just did a show on this for my series, Second Opinion, and we did a lot of research into this. And we had three or four different guests from you know, different areas of health. Um, and it really is uh, being translated, the data for the population is being translated um, to being an unhealthy generation because of specific things. Um, seeing young people come in with hypertension or obesity or type two diabetes, seeing, the, seeing these young people come in with these health conditions in their twenties, that's just not, that's something that's never been seen before in our history. And when you see young people um, finding so many of these uh, health complications at a point where it's a serious health complication, you can see that they're not having their annual checkups. You can see that they're not reaching out for help at early stages. All of this leads to higher cost of their, of their um, care. Uh, and then when it comes to the mental um, uh, and anxiety uh, piece of this puzzle, that is pointed to elevated levels of stress. And, you know, we, I talked about where all that stress is coming from, you know, whether it's on the job, whether it's in the home, whether it's taking care of elderly parents, whether it's um, connected to this new idea of comparing yourself to everyone else that is on the internet. Um, all of these things play together, I think, in increasing the anxiety. And if you increase anxiety of a population, you're going to increase stress. And there is a very um, proven link between stress and your immune system and your, your mental health. So, you know, I'd like to say, yes, it's just more data reporting. Uh, but I think the researchers would tell you that the evidence shows to unhealthy habits uh, exhibited by this population that make them the unhealthiest population that we've seen in any recent history. And we can all learn from that, remember, and generations coming behind it, students who are listening, these kind of, this kind of data has to be considered a call to action. Absolutely. Thank you, Joan. And even in, in my own research, I've been seeing the same thing you've mentioned about younger populations having type 2 diabetes and overweight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my studies in Brazil, India, and China, it's just startling to see how young all of these, you know, these, 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 the population is and, yeah. and the food habits that are changing with all the access to these ultra processed foods. So I totally yeah. agree with you on that. Thank you. 
Okay, the next question that we have here is, is there any way to change the course of media and news back to more objective and fact-based information that what, se that what seems like extreme bias, especially politically? Whoa, there's another genie that's out of the bottle. Can we put that genie back in the bottle? You know, I still really do believe that um, your major networks, um, you know, the ABC, NBC, CBS, that the evening news is still thoroughly researched and I consider that pretty unbiased. Um, the problem is, is that we've gotten uh, platforms, you know, cable news platforms that have really been built with a purposeful political bias. And then you see other platforms all of a sudden feel, oh my gosh, we've got to give the other side of the story. And thus you start seeing different networks um, almost uh, accidentally becoming politically biased. Um, you know, whatever your political inclination is, I think it's everyone's hope that, you know, in the coming uh, administration that maybe we can temp down the, 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 the just the, uh, the, the place where everybody is right now, they're screaming at each other. Even on the news networks, they're screaming at you. We need to temp that down, pull that back, pull in the reins. And hopefully, and I hope that as we might see in a future um, administration, the, the purposeful from at the top trying to temp that down, that news networks will also take that cue and, um, you know, and maybe take the lead and start doing that as well. Unfortunately, when you have so many internet platforms, and social media arguments going on, that, that's, much, that's a much tougher genie to put back in the bottle. And a lot, that's in large part due to those algorithms. The things, those things that, like watch that so, The Social Dilemma on Netflix, they put that like button in there to put positivity out into the world. So you could like this and you could like that. And what has it turned out to be? It's something that if young kids don't get enough likes, it affects their mental, um, state, their, their sense of themselves, their self-confidence. It was never intended to do that. But those are those little, those are the genies that are much, much more difficult to put back in the bottle. I'm a half glass full kind of girl though. So it's my hope that as we try to temp down like the temperature of, of our country and our differences and our divisiveness, that maybe we'll see the media, different forms of media, also take that lead. Yes, I agree. Thank you so much, Joan. Wonderful. Um, the next question that we have is, uh, what do you see as the role of scientific researchers in influencing public perceptions of science and health related findings? How can we productively interact with reporters and promote accurate representation of science in the media? And you know, it's really, the scientists aren't supposed to have to always get out there and kind of be in the line of fire. And there is, I think it's fair to say some reticence on the part of scientists to put themselves in the line of fire. And that's where media is supposed, we're supposed to stand in that space between scientists and the public so that we, so that we can be the ones in the line of fire. But of course, incumbent upon that means that we really have to accurately report the findings of the scientists. But what's happened recently, I think, is that, you know, when you have a, dis a growing distrust of the media, I think many scientists have felt compelled to come out there and be, and, and really the media pulls them out there and insists that they be on air. And I mean, this is an unprecedented change in a society where the people are attacking the scientists themselves. And we have to, in the next few years, somehow pull, we got to pull back from that because we must as a society rely on and look to our scientists to make sure that we keep the health of, health of a population and manage a pandemic. And all of this couldn't be happening at a worse time. Because in the next few months, you know, thank goodness, 
we're going to be seeing these vaccines and these new testing and these new treatments. Incredible, um, you know, uh, remarkable, really, results of the scientific community come on board. And we are going to need Americans to, we're going to need for them to feel that there's safety and efficacy in these treatments and in these vaccines. Because if we can't somehow, as the media, help translate that to the public, and if we don't have the trust in the media, it's going to be a pretty difficult, almost insurmountable effort to try to truly eradicate COVID-19 um, in this country and around the world, as we have shown that can be done. It was done with polio and other um, pandemics in the past. Um, but you have to have that trust of the public so that we can, I mean, not that the actual implementation of that, of the vaccinations um, isn't going to be almost insurmountable, but if you don't have the, the trust of the public in taking the vaccine, that is a huge roadblock. Yes, absolutely. I agree. And, and that's sort of something that we've seen historically. Now, building that trust and, you know, taking vaccines, it's something that, that we've talked about in my history population health class, and it's something that is going to be a potential roadblock. Absolutely. I agree. Um, the next question that we have from uh, one of our audience members is, Joan, do you think there is hope for the millennial generation to turn around the troubling trends? I do. And why? This is the most educated generation, many of them with post-secondary degrees. And yes, they came into the workforce at a very, very tough time. But as we come back, because I'm a hopeful person from this pandemic, and as jobs come back, I think this is a generation that when they can get back in uh, with you know good paying jobs, using all that education that they have, um, that they, that they will come around. Um, I really do believe that they will come around, but it's going to, I think it is going to take a massive awareness campaign targeted at them so that they understand the disconnect. That if they're disconnected and they're not going for annual exams and they're not hooked into a primary care physician that is their partner in their health, that's, that's probably one of the, I think that's one of the, biggest red flags with this millennial generation. But let's not forget, I mean, they're totally connected. So they're going to hear if we just had, have a great awareness campaign, they're going to hear it. And, and they're the most educated. So I think that it, it, I know it's like a ocean liner. Can you turn it? Can you turn it around? You know, like when you're talking about a whole generation, uh, it's going to be incumbent upon policymakers and the healthcare industry and the media in a combined effort, I think, to, to try to steer that big ocean liner back into a more rational way of looking at their healthcare. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Joan. Um, the next question we have is, have you seen the need to fact check uh, change the way journalists present talk about news stories today versus say 20 years ago? You mean, was that journalists? Did they yes. say we or did they say journalists? Uh, uh, the way journalists present, talk about their news stories, yes. Yeah, I think that um, you used to be able to, you know, do fact checking. It was relatively simple, you know, back in the day. Today, um, I can tell you, once a story is presented, I can even tell you from my own point of view, once a story is written about me that can have two or eight facts wrong. I can pretty much know that going forward next year and the next year and the next year, there are gonna be stories written about me and all those um, facts that were wrong will again appear in other stories. That's one of the dangers of the, net, of the internet, um, that facts come up and other people that are doing stories if they don't really fact check today, they can be adding all kinds of facts that are not real facts to their story and it gets perpetuated and it can get perpetuated and spread so quickly because that is just the nature of the internet and it's especially the nature 
of social media since that those platforms were built with those algorithms. Um, so, I mean, it's really incumbent upon reporters today to be extra vigilant. You know, when they look at a study, who is behind the study? Who funded the study? Is there an inherent um, purpose to make you see this study and believe that it's true? I don't think we ever had to do that in years past, but journalists today, you have to be careful as I was talking about in the speech about the words that you use in a study because, you know, a, it, it's bad in any kind of information, transfer of information, but when it's a transfer of health information, that can ultimately cause incredible harm to individuals, you know, and to their, to their health. Absolutely, I completely agree. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, the next question we have um, is, should the FCC fairness doctrine be reinstated? Uh, the, the audience member quotes from the Wikipedia, uh, this fairness doctrine is, uh, the fairness doctrine of the United States Federal Commission uh, introduced in 1949 was a policy that required the holders of broadcast licenses to both present controversial issues of public importance and to do so in a manner that was, in the FCC's view, honest, equitable, and balanced. Uh, the FCC eliminated the policy in 1987 and removed the rule uh, that implemented the policy from the Federal Register in August 2011. Well, if you want my opinion, oh yes, we should. <laughs> um, because that is, that's, what we should all be going by in the media. Um, and I don't know the, the underlying circumstances of it being negated, but certainly um, that would hold uh, news networks and cable networks. Uh, you know, it's not just the AMA and the American Medical Association coming out with this plea to do it right. Um, if we have uh, governmental, you know, policymakers insisting on it, uh, you know, that might be one way to like put the brake on what we're seeing right now um, and kind of, you know, pull in the reins and get back to more factual reporting. So thank you for that bit of information, whoever put that out there. I think I might follow up on that one. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, the, the next question is, um, as a journalist, how do you separate your beliefs and opinions from impacting the news you report? So I will tell you that when I was on Good Morning America, we, our goal, both with David Hartman and later with Charlie Gibson, our, my hosts, our goal was to, if we did a debate, um, let me think of one, um, Al Gore, no, Tipper Gore and, um, uh, Jerry Garcia, okay? Jerry Garcia and Tipper Gore debating over whether or not you should put, um, you know, stamps on uh, record labeling, you know, so that you could see if there was bad language, et cetera. My goal in that debate was that at the end of it, you should not know which side I stand on it. That was our goal. It was never to give our opinion. It was also to elicit, always to elicit the opinions of our guests or our debating guests. Now, interestingly, we would always get boxes of mail because remember back then we didn't have email. Um, we would get boxes of mail from people that said, I know you were on this side or I know you were on that side because they watched with their own glasses, with their own points of view. So they saw it in different ways. But ultimately, we, we, that was our goal, to not let you know our opinion. And I don't need, need I say that that has changed today. And we see um, not so much on, I think, the network sh news shows, but certainly on a lot of cable shows, we see um, news anchors giving their own opinion all the time. That is a huge shift in the news media. Um, if you want my personal opinion, I don't think it's a good shift. <laughs> uh, but again, that, that's one of those 
unfortunately, one of those genies is going to be pretty hard to put back in the bottle. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is, um, in your experience, what are some of the challenges of acquiring news from social media versus more reputable sources, especially among the young gener younger generation? How can we engage younger generations in seeking health information from more reputable sources? Well, that is difficult because when, you know, when they, they look at the younger generations as a population, what are they looking at? And they're looking at Instagram and they're looking at Snapchat, they're looking at TikTok, they're looking at YouTube, and those are just filled with misinformation. And social media, they're not on Facebook, that's for all of us old people. But, you know, when you target information even, you can figure out who, which generation is watching which social media platform. That's how healthcare, the healthcare industry and public uh, health officials and the media look to target. Um, it's difficult though, if, if you can't get their eyeballs onto more reputable sources, it's, it's a very difficult uh, effort to try to get them to start looking at more reputable um, sources. Um, and it, but again, I think the answer is for the public health system and public health officials and media to try to start targeting, um, sorry for all you younger people, but to target those, those sites that you're looking at to try to encourage you to, um, to look at more uh, uh, verifiable sources and maybe to start putting a lot of those verifiable sources of information onto those sites. This is, this is the big challenge right now, tech companies, it's the, um, the challenge of you know, the, the media industry. Uh, because you know, it used to be that even young people watched, I used to have, I have people come to me all the time. I grew up watching you on Good Morning America. Every morning, we always watched you on Good Morning America. Well, now you have um, the, a lot of the young generation really only getting their, their information and their news from their laptop. My girls who are now in their 30s, they all wanted TVs in their room. My teenagers, I have four teenagers, two sets of twins in high school. They don't ask for TVs in their room because they're not looking at TV. They're looking at their laptop. So they're not tending to watch um, you know, the evening news. They are looking at different sites. And the big danger in that is that different sites often have their own agenda. So, you know, this is a shift. These are all these demographic shifts in populations that, as I said, have major consequences. It's not just a demo, it's not just a pandemic. These are just nuances, the little nuances of societal trends um, and trends and generations that have huge health consequences. Yes, thank you. I completely agree. I was actually thinking about this the other day uh, of the youth that I know not watching television news and watching shows. I mean, that's certainly something that I always did. And I went, grew up watching you on TV and, mm -hmm. and getting a lot of the news from TV. But now it seems like social media and computers are the way where all this information is going. So I, I completely agree. And, it's, and it can be very dangerous in some ways. And by um, the way, I just want to say I also grew up on TV. I was 25 years old. Yeah. <laughs> 25 years old. Yeah. I went, I started Good Morning America when I, I started working for them when I was 27 years old. Wow. So I just want wow. you to know that I grew up right along with you. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, well, we have time for just one or two more questions. Uh, the next question is, um, um, over the past 30 years or so, the definition of what um, a journalist's role really is certainly seems to have changed quite a bit since the proliferation of social media platforms, growth of the internet, and people claiming to be quote unquote journalists and publishing information, disinformation, misinformation, whether knowingly or unknowingly. How has, the, how has this affected things like the professionalism and training of people claiming to be quote unquote journalists? for the population health space and even generally across the study of journalism in your opinion? 
Well, that's interesting because boy, that's another shift in how, how we have seen the consequences of it. You know, when I first came into um, journalism, uh, it was in the late seventies. I became the host of Good Morning America in 1980. You could almost name a lot of the journalists, you know, on a, on two hands. I mean, it was a it was a it was a tough uh, thing to become a national journalist. Uh, and now we there has been this shift to the point that almost anyone these days can have their their iPhone and come to a come to an event and call themselves a journalist and start a website and be reporting for their website. You know, <clears throat> the wonderful thing about the internet and about everybody having a phone with them is that something can't happen in some in the far reaches of, of the globe and nobody knows about it. And that's a wonderful thing because there can be horrible stories um, happening to people. And in the world today, there will probably be eyes on them. The bad part of it, of course, is that it's so easy. There's just a plethora of places where you can go to get your news, which are not necessarily trained journalists in the sense of what trained journalists were, you know, in the 80s or 90s or even the 2000s. I mean, it has really come to a point that um, it, it has become far too easy for someone to call themselves a journalist. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know if you can, I don't know if you can pull that one back on I mean, that, you know, I, even the glass half girl, girl, the glass half full girl might say that it's a tough one to pull back. Um, however, the, at least just the um, understanding that that exists, I guess, puts us all in better stead because we'll question who we're taking our news from. Yes, thank you. Yes. And we get, unfortunately, we just have time for one more question. And our last question is, um, how does the media landscape now compare to when you started your career? And where do you see it going? Are there any ways to combat the fragmentation and polarization that, le that lead to uh, everyone having their own set of facts? Yeah. Well, I will tell you that I can remember, like when I entered the media, there was ABC, NBC, and CBS. That's it. Oh, and PBS. Can't forget PBS. My new show is going to be on PBS. Um, that was it. And I remember the day that we were all standing around in the newsroom at ABC and CNN came on board. It came up on, up on the airwaves and we were all like, whoa, they're gonna report the news 24 seven? Because, you know, we had our morning show, we had the evening news and, you know, everybody worked hard to get those two. They're gonna be doing a 24 seven, is that even possible? And that was the beginning. I mean, that, you know, I remember that incredible change. Um, and by the way, we didn't have all the internet sites at that point. Uh, and then as more cable stations came on, um, I always felt that as we got more platforms racing to be first, that just inherent in that itself um, wasn't necessarily uh, good for television news. I remember the first time uh, when I started, everything was on film. In fact, as a reporter, I used to edit my own film, literally. Um, and then we got videotape. And then the day came, I was still uh, reporting at Eyewitness News at the time. I, I was just a reporter at Good Morning America. Uh, I wasn't the host yet. And we got our first live truck, our first live satellite truck. And we were sent to a story from New York City out to Long Island. And as we kind of pulled up in front of this big demonstration, as I was getting out of the truck and they were putting the, the big dish up on top of the truck, as I put the IFB into my ear, I heard coming to Joan in 30. It's like, what do you mean coming to me in 30 seconds? I just got here. That little episode very much forewarned me <laughs> of the future of broadcasting. 
because I had always been, you know, I'd always gone to a story, you talk to people, you find out both sides, you go back and while your film is being edited, you think and you write the story to come up with the right factual story on the six o'clock news. And that was literally being changed in those 30 seconds. So, um, and of course, need I say, now we have, you know, hundreds of news outlets and they're trying to bring you the most, the, the news, the fastest, be the first to get out there. They're looking for different nuances to try to add so their post piece won't be exactly the same as everyone else's. I mean, there's good to that and there's also inherent bad to that kind of change in journalism. Yes, I, I completely agree, and and uh, you know it's it's. Uh, thank you so much. That's that was wonderful. And unfortunately, uh, we're out of time for taking any more questions. But I would just like to thank you so much, uh, Joan, for taking the time to join us today and for being our inaugural speaker for our, our College of Health Colloquium series. It's certainly been an honor to have you uh, join us today and to start our colloquium series. Uh, you know, as a political scientist, some of the studies media and effects on politics and, you know, health and policy, I, I've, I've learned so much and, and continue to learn a lot from your work. And, and I just want to thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's been a wonderful time having you um, 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 join us. And, uh, and I'm sure if, if anyone has any further questions, uh, I can, you know, feel free to, to, to contact me. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and you also have a website. Is that right, Joan? That, 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 Absolutely, joanlondon.com. They can follow me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, but my my Facebook feed, um, I don't allow any of the political fighting. And it's interesting because if every now and then somebody comes in with, you know, a really nasty comment, you'll see ten other people come and say, "Hey, that's this is not that kind of platform," so that everybody feels free and comfortable and safe to give opinions. Um, so, uh, but they can, you know. Uh, reach out to me on any of those. And of course, Ed right now is my, is one of my connections to Lehigh, but I must say I live with a connection because my husband, Jeff Konigsberg, went to Lehigh, graduated, played basketball for Lehigh. Wow. Yeah. His sister, um, my sister-in-law, uh, Leslie Levy, she also went to Lehigh. So there's a lot of Lehigh connections around here. Oh, that's great. And we're going to maintain those connections. And, yes. and thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, Joan. We really appreciate it. And happy Thanksgiving uh, to you and your family. And, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Yeah, everyone stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye.